You know, when we think about what Jesus has done, and I encourage you to keep that ever present in your thinking as much as you can. Think about what all that Jesus has done, all that was accomplished on the cross. Because when you think that you fully know and understand, when you think you can fully appropriate it to yourself, there is more. And one of those things, and I feel it's a confirming word for this morning's message, is that God has set out a rescue plan for us. He rescues us from our own devices. He rescues us from doing life our own way. He rescues us from sin. But He also rescues us from our pain. He rescues us from our pain. He loves you and He loves me, and I'm so thankful for that. He loves you and He loves me even though He knows you and He knows me. He chooses to love us just the same. I want to start this morning with a story. In his book, Leadership Pain, Sam Chand writes, pain isn't the enemy. The inability or unwillingness to face pain is a far greater danger. He then tells a story of Dr. Paul Brand, who was treating a four-year-old named Tanya at the, at the National Leprosy Hospital in Carville, L.A. As he examined her dislocated ankle, he noticed she appeared bored and felt no pain at all. She was diagnosed with a congenital indifference to pain, a condition similar to leprosy. Years later, he learned that Tanya had lost both legs to amputation and most of her fingers. Her elbows were constantly dislocated, and she suffered sepsis from ulcers. She chewed her own tongue so badly that it was swollen and lacerated. Her father had abandoned the family, calling Tanya a monster. Dr. Band writes, Tanya is no monster, only an extreme example, a human metaphor really, of life without pain. One night after a flight to London, Dr. Band went to his hotel room and began to undress. When he took off his shoes, he realized he has no sensation in his foot. The numbness terrified him. He stuck, a, uh, he stuck a pin in the skin below his ankle, and there was no pain. He pushed it deeper into, a, into his flesh until blood appeared, and still, no pain. All night, he tossed and turned, wondering if he had caught leprosy. How would it affect his personal life? Would he have to leave his personal family and live in a colony? The next morning when he awakened, he picked up a pin and stuck it into his ankle. This time, he yelled because it really hurt. From that day forward, whenever he felt discomfort from a cut or anything else, he responded with genuine gratitude. Thank God for pain. And then Sam Chand writes, paradoxically, Christians have more difficulty handling personal pain than unbelievers. They look at the promises of God and conclude that God would fill their lives with joy, love, support, and success. That's reading the Bible selectively, and we're all guilty of doing that. The Scriptures state clearly and often the enduring pain is one of the ways, perhaps the main way, God works His grace deeply into our lives. People strive for happiness in their lives, but are formed through suffering and often at the hands of criticism. I know, I know personally know nothing about criticism. That, that's a joke. Even if the criticism is untrue, ask God, what are you trying to accomplish by this in my life? So our response to pain shouldn't be to avoid it, but to embrace it by trying to redeem something bad, by turning it, in, turning it into something sacred. For in all things, God works, God, for in all things, God works for good. Embracing the pain of criticism is never easy or painless, but it is a path to holiness and a means by which God, God's purposes can be fulfilled in us. Today's message is simply titled, Facing Pain. Facing Pain. He has the bad news. I'm hopefully going to get to some good news because God's Word is good news. We have to consider turning from where we are right now and decide and determine to face our pain. Unfortunately, it's real that there has been so much of that. Personally, in the last two weeks, just whether it's 
close to me or a little bit further afield from me. I just feel that it, it's kind of surrounding us right now. Disappointment, death, sickness, depression, even fear. As a church who seeks to build and beautify in the city where God has placed us, we have to see and acknowledge our own pain. If we cannot do that, how can we ever hope to grow a heart of compassion for our city? Answer is we can't. Prayers that can heal emotional distress are called laments. The scripture from Psalm 13 that David read this morning is a prayer of lament. A prayer of lament is a prayer of pain, of hurt, and of struggle. Why would we neglect to go to God with those things, the one who died for us, the one who is called the lover of our soul? Why would we neglect to go to God with those things? Like it's somehow shameful to go to God because we're struggling, because He's only this God of good things. Really? No ways. He's the God of your soul, your spirit, your, your body, but He's the God even of your pain. He's still God in your pain. Now, when you get to reading the Psalms, I love the Psalms, it, you, de, you start to determine that the writers of the Psalms, they were real people going through very real stuff. It was all going on all around them. Even sometimes in one psalm, you see them going from, oh, it's so terrible, my enemies are terrible, but you are, you're good, Lord, and fantastic. You know me in my innermost, Lord. You, you think, what is going on with these people? Can they just keep track of their emotions? You understand that these are written by real people, just like you and I. A third of the psalms are prayers of lament, honest and vulnerable and raw. A prayer, of, a prayer of lament, rather, has three key parts. First, you recount your pain. So for you and I, especially for the men, <laughs> you know I'm talking to you. Your wives are busy nudging you right now. You recount your pain. In other words, you, you talk about it. You talk about what's, what's causing you pain, what, what's causing you difficulty in your life. And then the next part of, of a lament is you recall God's character how good He is, what He's about, what He's done, what He can do, what He will do. And then you resolve, this is the third part of a lament, you resolve to trust God. Now, today's scripture, today's key passage forms a, a middle part of a pattern of lament in the Psalms. This, part, this portion that I'm going to read to you is recalling the character of God. And it goes like this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As you well know by now, that is Psalm 23. The reality is, is because we just live in the world, and it's a fallen world, we get hurt. We experience pain, not only physical pain, but spiritual and emotional pain. It's part of our existence. I know for sure that in a room like this, even online, you, you watching online, if I had to ask you to indicate who in this room has never felt pain, I wouldn't even get one hand. That's just the reality of our existence as we live out our faith in this, uh, the enemy's territory. We get hurt physically by accidents disease. We get hurt emotionally by disappointments, by relationships. Oh. Sometimes people hurt us accidentally. Sometimes they do it intentionally with purpose behind it. 
Psalm 23 and verse 5, remember what it says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Now, I don't know about you, but we have to look at how we all handle our hurts. The reality is, and it's very unfortunate, is that we often don't handle our hurts in the right way. We tend to mess it up. If we had to examine how we handle our hurts, it, it, the picture would be really like a large rug in a living room, but it was sitting about this high off the ground because of so much that has been swept underneath that rug. That's how we normally tend to handle our pain. Frankly, friends, and I'm, I'm being encouraging here, that's dysfunctional. It's not going to help you. It's not going to help anybody around you. It's not going to help those who you love. It's not going to help you in your relationship with Jesus. It is just not good. There are right ways and wrong ways to deal with pain. I want to first major on some of the wrong ways that we tend to deal with pain. I've, I've kind of inferred it already, but we tend to ignore it, don't we? We, we ignore it. You know, it's that macho approach. I'll just suck it up. <sighs> I'm tough. I'll move on. I'll just pretend it doesn't exist. I hope that it'll go away. We try to deny it. Well, it didn't hurt me. I'm not mad. I'm fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. Everybody's fine. It'll be fine. Maybe we delay it. You know, you don't get mad in the moment, but you start to think about it. You go through it, through it in your mind, and, and you resolve in your mind, I'm not going to get mad. I'm just going to get even. But there's a delay on your pain. Or you minimize it. You minimize it. Ah, it's, it's not a big deal. You may think it's a big deal. For me, it's not a big deal. And, and what you are not saying, but you definitely mean is, I'm tough. I can deal with this. It's really not a problem. I'm not offended at all. You see, ignoring your pain doesn't heal your pain. Did you know that? I don't know if you've ever got a, a, a deep cut in your flesh. Just sim simply leaving it there and ignoring it is not necessarily going to help it. Oftentimes, when there is a wound, leaving it just means that any infection that is there just grows worse. And oftentimes with pain, emotional pain and spiritual pain, it lands on us and immediately there's an infection. It affects who you are. It affects your spirit. It affects your soul. It permeates deep into who you are and your whole person. So just simply leaving it and hoping that time will heal all wounds, that's something we know very well. It really that's a way, I guess, that we can try and resolve our pain, but I promise you, and I'm here to say to you this morning, that's really not going to work. Denying it, delaying it, minimizing it, ignoring it, that's not healthy for you. Psalm 39 and verse 2, I was mute and silent. I held my peace to no avail, and then what it says, and my distress grew worse. Are you getting the picture yet that the Psalms were written by people just like you and I, real people, flesh and blood? And my distress grew worse. Ignoring our pain does not work. It really simply gets worse. It can fester and grow from the inside out, polluting our person. You may be walking around and have been hurt and injured and criticized and disappointed and all those kinds of things. You think you've got over it, but you really haven't. You think you got over it, but everyone else around you go, there's something off. Because especially when we try and ignore things and hide things, it, regardless of what you want to portray, it doesn't matter. It comes out of you. You can't help it. It's in your facial expressions, it's in your posture, it's in your eye contact or lack of eye contact. It comes out of you. It's the way you speak or speak about a person or persons. Especially, especially, especially unforgiveness and bitterness. You may, you may be able to hide it for a season, but I promise you, as you choose to ignore it and get past it, it will seep out of you. Jesus makes it clear of how it impacts us. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34, you brood of vipers. That's a good way to start. 
You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? (laughs) Okay, Jesus, we're listening now. And then he says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever's here, whatever your heart is full of, whether you try, you can try so hard, you can try and hide, you can try and ignore or deny, no matter what happens, it's going to take, it's, it's going to make its way and most likely come out of there, especially when you're pressed or under pressure. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Ignoring our pain will not work. The other thing that we tend to try and do is we just try and run from it. We run from it. We'll just move away. We'll just get away, escape, retreat. It's human nature. When we feel pain, we go into that that posture, don't we? It's either fight, flight, or fright. It's our response to pain or, or crisis. Often what we do is flight. We get away. We move away. We get into a place of so-called safety. Look at what it says in Psalm 55 and verse 6. And I say, oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would wander away. I would wander far away, rather. I would lodge in the wilderness. Selah. I would hurry to find shelter from the raging wind and tempest. When people are hurt, when people are in pain, they run. I could tell you stories of all the years I've been a follower of Jesus, all the years that I've been leading in some capacity in church, that people have gotten hurt, and now they're not in church anymore because of that hurt and because of that pain, because they tried to deny it and that didn't work, and eventually what they did was just run. And you know what? Sometimes the worst case scenario, it really didn't go well. People want run to a whole array of things. They don't just simply run into a void. They run to something else. People run to watching a lot of television. People run to escapism like movies. Sometimes it's, it's drugs or alcohol. Sometimes it's shopping. Frankly, I would choose that one (laughs) if I could. Sometimes relationships end in divorce. Maybe for some it's it's alcohol or it's sex or pornography or or whatever else they can find to help relieve that pain. But the problem is the problem, the the pain is still with them. The The pain is still there. Running doesn't solve it. Your geography and your location does not solve your pain. I've lived in three countries. I will tell you that firsthand. My geography has not taken away certain of my pain. There is an acronym, BLAST, B L A S T, BLAST. It stands for boredom, loneliness, anger, stress, and tiredness. The brain, the limbic system in the brain, processes all of these things as pain. If you don't believe me, if you've ever been around a little child, I mean little, like three, whatever, little. And if, you, and if you ever witness them, they get very, very bored. What, what tends to happen? Because they've not developed those social filters. They literally start to groan, don't they? I'm so bored. I mean, I do that and I'm 48. But that's different, okay? Because their brain is processing that boredom as pain. Whenever, whenever you experience pain, what do you do? You try and seek out something to dull the pain. I don't know about you, but if I burn myself, I try and find the, the, the closest stream of running cold water to dull the pain that I'm going through. It's that reaction that we have. So when you experience pain that boredom, that loneliness, that anger, that stress, or that tiredness, you seek out something to dull that pain. And then what do you do? For example, well, do you know what? I'm going to have a drink this evening, or three. (laughs) And somehow it helps that pain. Sometimes it does. 
And so do you know, the next time you feel pain, that boredom, boredom, that loneliness, that anger, that stress, or that tiredness, I'll do that again. I'm, this evening, I'm going to have a drink or three. And you find that it, that it helps you in some way. And then, and then what starts to happen in the, in, in the brain is it forms something called a neural pathway. And so what is happening, it's burnt this neural pathway. So in your brain, that now becomes like a default setting. You don't even have to think about it. I'm pain. I know what I'm going to do this evening. It's formed that neural pathway. Listen, I'm picking on alcohol, but it could be, it could be anything. It could be any kind of escapism to help you try, deal with that pain. Watching too, many, too much TV late into the night, you're neglecting your family, it's gambling, it's addictive behavior, it's all these kinds of things. And because we're, 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 because we're trying to run away from pain, instead what has happened is you form these neural pathways in your brain, these default settings, and that's now how you live. It's habit and it's addiction, and that's how you behave, and it can be destructive for you. So running away from your pain does, does not work. It doesn't help you. So I, the other thing that we try is we try and hide from it. Yes, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just hide from my pain. Many of us are very good at doing this. We wear a mask. I'm not talking about a face mask. I'm talking about a, a mask. You know, you put on a mask for people, a different kind of persona or personality. We don't tell anybody that we're hurt. I'm fine. You're fine. Everything's fine. Everything's going to be fine. I'm fine. We, come, we become good. We become quite conditioned then at camouflaging our pain. We, 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 we have devices that can hide it and cover up when we're feeling pain or we're feeling it more than we did yesterday. We don't like to admit that something or someone has hurt us, has hurt our feelings, that has impacted, our, impacted us deeply, our spirit and our emotions. If we admit that we're hurt, we open ourselves up to more hurt. We make ourselves vulnerable. And so we'd rather hide it out of a sense of kind of self-protection. I'm not, I'm not getting on you. I'm not criticizing you. I've done all of these things, I promise. Just to be clear, my thing when I ran from it was Netflix, okay? Just to help you out. Netflix. Revealing your pain or your feel, feelings is the beginning. I promise you it's the beginning of your healing. James chapter 5 and verse 16, therefore confess, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. I would say that there's a bit of a step here that we need to, that we need to take into account. The forgiveness step. Sometimes what we do, we talk to someone in order that we can get into the place of forgiveness. But I believe that's some kind of deception because forgiveness is not a feeling. If you think it's a feeling, it isn't a feeling. Forgiveness is a decision. Just like Jesus chose and he decided to forgive you and I. So if you start with the decision of forgiveness or dealing with your unforgiveness and then you talk to someone about it, that will then initiate in some points and catalyze in other points your journey of hurt and of pain. I want to give you a caution. This verse is not talking about public confession. It's speaking about confessing to another follower of Jesus that you trust. What do I mean by your, you can trust them? That they are a confidential person. You trust them and they trust you. You can pray for one another. You can encourage one another. You can lift one another up. It takes mature Christians, mature followers of Jesus to care for one another, hear one another, and pray for one another. Listen, the, this is the reality. Everybody is hurt. We're all hurt. We're all going through life trying to deal with stuff. Sometimes we deal with stuff better than we deal with other stuff, but we're all hurt in some way. We all still have remnant and scars of hurt, physically and also emotionally, maybe even spiritually. We're all hurt. Don't think that you're alone. You're not even alone in the way that you are hurt. There are many that are going through the circumstance that you are going through.
First John chapter 1 and verse 9, walk in the light as he is in the light. Oftentimes when we discuss things and talk to one another, that's why, we, that's why we're trying to foster community in the church, that we can speak to each other and trust one another and, and encourage one another, that those things that we live with, that pain that we live with in the dark, that we can bring it out into the light. When it's in the dark, do you know who, who doctors it and, 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 and takes care of it? The devil. When we bring it into the light, do you know who takes care of it then? The Spirit of God. Rather bring it in the light, man. Share your hurt in a place that is safe and healing will begin. Hiding has never helped anyone. The other thing we do so well, it's like a, a 21st century badge of honor that if we don't do this, people ask, what is wrong with you? We worry over it. Worry has become a badge of honor. I'm concerned, I'm worried, I'm stressed, I'm anxious, I'm busy, whatever. Worry, it's like this badge of honor that we wear. We hover our hurt like a mother hen hovers over her chicks. Worry, if you think about it like this, is an attempt to control what is not controllable. There are things in your life that friends, unfortunately to say, you cannot control. That was very upsetting to me, by the way. It's part, I'm not even joking, I'm admitting something to you right now. It's part of the reason why I'm terrified of flying. It's because I'm not driving the plane. I'm being deadly serious. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what those noises are, those sounds are. I know that when they take off, they're meant to hit the, the switch for their fuel reserve and all of that. I'm thinking, Lord Jesus, I hope they've got their finger on their switch just in case. And the fact that I'm not there in the cop cockpit to make sure that everything's going okay as it should be totally freaks me out, and I'm terrified of flying. That's called public confession right there. <laughs> Thank you. Worry is playing the pain over and over and over again in your life. Here is what God tells us, however, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2, set your minds on the things that are above. I mean, I thought I did that by, you know, trying to control the flying thing, but that's not what he meant. Set your things on, th set your mind on things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Did you ever notice that Colossians even tells us why we should set our mind on heavenly things? Because you died. Now, what that means is we've died to self. When we fully died to self, we have to rely on Christ. And your life is hidden with Christ. Think about, think about that. It's hidden. It's covered. It's protected. It's sheltered. It's hidden with Christ in God. If Jesus is really in charge, why? Why then should I worry? I've heard worry being described as practical atheism. Harsh, but if you start to think about it, you understand. Worry never solves problems. It never heals hurts. The more you worry about something, the bigger it becomes. Worry never, ever adds anything. It never adds anything. It only takes away, and worry can't help you. The other thing we do, we become bitter. We, come, we become bitter about our pain. Bitterness doesn't make you better, I promise you that. We, we, we call it being sensible. We're calling it not, you know, we, we're just not going to trust them again because they'll just hurt us again. We call it all kinds of things. We assign it all kinds of duties in our life that just make sense. But really what it is, it's bitterness. We get angry and then we clothe ourselves with the self-pity. Well, I'm just protecting myself. I'm just being wise. I'm being intelligent. I'm, use, I'm using the wisdom of the Lord. Nonsense. You're bitter. Bitterness hurts you more than it does anybody else. It's self-destructive behavior.
Bitter is that poison intended for someone else, but at the end of the day kills you. It develops you into a certain kind of person with a certain kind of posture, with a certain kind of outlook in life. I promise you, no one enjoys when you are bitter. No one. James chapter 1 and verse 20, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. No matter how well, no matter how well you know the Word of God, it does not produce the righteousness of God. Anger and bitterness will never heal hurt. What does heal your hurt? Psalm chapter 23 and verse 5. Here's some ways that we should deal with hurt. What does it say in verse 5 of Psalm 23? It starts off with a very key word. It says, you, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Each time you is there, it's with a specific plan. It's the Lord himself that we're calling you. He is the one that can heal your hurt. So how do you allow him to do that? I'm glad you asked. You need to let him protect you. You need to let Jesus protect you. That three-letter word right there is let. It speaks of permission. You go right back to the book of Genesis. If you want to see how man has developed to where they are, you go to the very beginning. It's the beginning. It's the book of beginnings. What did he do? He never, he gave them free will and he never went against their free will. So for you and I, where you are and what you're dealing with and the hurt that you're feeling right now, you need to let Jesus protect you. You need to give him permission, give him room to be able to protect you. We are the sheep of his flock. I don't know how often or how much time you've spent with sheep, but there's a few things that I know is that they have many enemies, many enemies. Wolves, coyotes, bears, ticks, snakes, they're utterly defenseless animals. They really are. Did I mention how stupid they also are? But that's a different side of things. They don't run fast. Although, interestingly, I tried to catch one once, outran me. Don't know what to say about that. But they just, they don't run that fast. They're not a cheater. They don't have sharp teeth. They don't have claws. They don't have a powerful hoof that they can swing around and hurt someone or uh, predators. They need protection. Where do they get their protection from? Their protection comes from the shepherd. We are his sheep and we need to let him protect us. The job of the shepherd is to lead, it's to feed, and it's to oversee. Part of overseeing the sheep is to protect them to cover them, to surround them. That's part of the job of the sheep. God says, let me handle the hurt that you have. But I don't have hurt. Oh, there he goes again. Seriously, let God protect you. Let Jesus protect you. Let him set things straight. Let him take care of your enemies. Let him set a table before you, even in the presence of your enemies. Let him Romans chapter 12 and verse 17, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never revenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. If you leave it to him, he will protect you. Part of having faith in God is trusting that He will protect you. Do you know there's a promise just like that, even in the book of Malachi? In in terms of your provision, this is not in my notes. I feel a prompting from the Holy Spirit. Is that He will protect, protect you from the devourer. The devourer is the one who seeks to take away your provision. He will protect you if you honor Him. He will protect you, but you've got to let him protect you. The longer you try to get revenge, the longer that you are not trusting God, the longer you try to get one better than your enemies, you're not trusting God. Then you need to let Jesus heal you. 
What does let speak of? Permission. Imagine going into a doctor's room and they want to heal you, but you don't let them heal you. You punch and kick them when they come near you with any sharp object or with a stethoscope or with the opinion of what is wrong with you. That doesn't make sense, does it? I'll go to a doctor's room, I want to be healed, but don't do anything. It's stupid. So why would you come to church? Why would you come into the presence of God as a hurt person and and you're praying these prayers to God and then not let Him heal you? It does not make any sense at all. You need to let Him heal you. You need to make room. You need to give Him opportunity. You need to be real and vulnerable and raw and honest with Him. You know, there are two reasons that shepherds put oil on the heads of sheep. Firstly, to soothe, and secondly, to heal. I forgot one enemy that a sheep has that you've maybe overlooked. I definitely did. Flies. Frankly, they're my enemy too. Don't even get me. I get triggered when I talk about flies. Like when I go to heaven, I'm like, Lord, we need a chat. Flies, mosquitoes, gluten, talk to me. But they have two enemies. I mean, this one key enemy It's like their worst, which just flies. They bite them. They get irritated by these flies. These flies will bite the heads of sheep so much and so badly that the heads of sheep will start bleeding, and then that bleeding will attract more flies. These little things can cause so much discomfort, so much pain, and so much irritation. And what the shepherd does is he takes olive oil and mixes it with a bit of sulfur, and he puts that mixture on the head of the sheep as an insect repellent, and that keeps the flies away. You see, look look at the job, look at the work of the shepherd to the sheep. The other way that the oil is used is like an ointment. When the sheep would have an open wound, the shepherd puts oil on it and it helps the healing process and it takes some of that irritation and pain, it takes it away. That's the job of the shepherd. Psalm 147, he says, he heals the brokenhearted and he and binds up their wounds. He binds up their wounds. That's why the process of mourning is so important that you could start to let Jesus heal you so that he could do the work of healing in your life. And I'm not just talking about mourning after death. I'm talking sometimes we need to take time and mourn after hurt. We need to take time and mourn after disappointment. We need to take time and mourn after relational breakdown. Why? Because it hurts and, it's, and you've lost something and take time to mourn. We've built up this bravado that we could just get through it. Like, yeah, yeah, I mean, this, uh, we need to take time. It's what the good shepherd does for us. Sometimes he heals us or helps our healing by sending people to us. This is called fellowship. We all need fellowship. Three minutes after our service, we, we ask you as a rule. We, we've created a rule because we can As a rule, we've asked you to connect with someone that you don't know in the church, that we can foster community and foster fellowship. Who knows in your pain today, you're going to meet someone and shake their hand that God has sent to you to help your healing. You don't know that, but He knows that. Sometimes He heals us by by making His presence known in our lives. Do you know what that's called? It's called worship. Sometimes healing takes place right away. Sometimes it takes time. But God always heals us when we trust Him, when we let Him. He heals the brokenhearted. That is a promise, friends, I promise that you can count on. And even when we've been totally healed, unfortunately, and you know this very well, I'm sure that they're always, almost always, scars. Scars are often there, sometimes long after you've been hurt. Unfortunately, you see those scars, you're aware of those scars, you realize that you behave differently because of those scars. You know, recently, I made a decision, a 
I've just turned 48. November next year, I'll be turning 50. I can do math. I realize stuff has happened in my life. I realized there's been some trauma. There's, I've experienced some dysfunction. I realized I was going through life hurt, and there was some pain and some stuff that I needed to see to. And I realized as a, as a, a male in turning 50 soon that I needed to take care of stuff. So I, I signed up for counseling. And I confused them a little bit. They said, what do you want to come and see us for? I said, uh, well, it's preemptive. I'm not crazy yet, but I'm sure I will be someday. I'm serious. And so I signed up for counseling. And this is the reason why. Because when we see the scars of our hurt, we can either look at the scars and remember the hurt, or we can look at the scars and remember the healing. I realized that some of my hurt was impacting how I related to my kids and to my wife and even to my friends. Because I was looking at the scars and I was remembering the hurt and I was remembering the hurt and I was remembering the hurt and I wasn't remembering any of the healing that took place. You see, it's your choice where you focus. You can focus on the hurt or you can focus on the healer, but you need to make that choice. Reminding ourselves that God cares, I promise you, will bring you comfort. Reminding, you, reminding ourselves, ourselves that He's the shepherd, that He's the comforter, that He brings you peace, that will help you. And you need to let the Lord bless you. You need to let Him bless you. You need to give Him permission to bless you. In the Scripture, it speaks about, in Scripture rather, whenever you see uh, the symbol or read about the symbol of an overflowing cup, it's a, it's a symbol of satisfaction in God. It re represents that all my needs, all my needs are cared for. I'm totally taken care of. I'm totally blessed. I'm not just a little blessed. I'm supersized blessed. I'm so blessed that my, my cup is full to the brim and it's overflowing. I want to ask you, are you living a life where you are overflowing with healing and blessing and life to the full? Are you living in God's victory? Are you? Are you living in God's victory? You need to be honest with yourself. If you have Jesus as your Savior, if you're online or if you're in person, if Jesus is your Savior, that you're living in right relationship with Him, you're living in intimate relationship with Him, then you can make that claim and statement too that my cup is overflowing. Are you living in God's abundance? What it looks like to live with my cup overflowing, it overflows with hope. I have hope. I've got something to hope in. I've got something to hope for. May the God of hope fill, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, your hope may abound. Romans chapter 15. Do you abound in hope? When you sing, do you sing with hope? When you pray, do you pray with hope and expectation? When you get up in the morning, is there hope in your heart? Yes, times are tough. We've been through a tough time. Yes, I get that. But is there hope? Because if there's hope, then you still can cling to victory. If you're a follower of Jesus, your cup overflows with love. First Thessalonians, and I'm taking this very intentionally from the message. It says, and may the master pour on the love so it fills your lives and splashes over on everyone around you, just as it does from us to you. I tell you, when you are overflowing with love, people are gonna know you by what you bring into a situation. Is your cup overflowing with love? Does your cup overflow with joy? John chapter 16 from the message again. Ask in my name. 
according to my will, and he'll most certainly give it to you. Your joy will be a river overflowing in its banks. I don't know, have you ever noticed that? When someone is overflowing with joy, they change the atmosphere. Now, worship team, I'm not talking about the pre-service meetings when I tell jokes. That's different, okay? Have you ever experienced that? Someone comes into your, your space and they're overflowing with joy and there's authentic joy and it just changes everything. It changes the, the dynamic of your gathering. Have you ever been in someone's home and you're wondering, when should we leave? You don't want to be those people, right? Am I right? You don't want to. I mean, Mike, it's different for you. You're Italian. But still, you don't want to be those people. You don't want to be those people that overstay your welcome. In the Middle East, they have a custom that they will continue to fill your cup as long as you're welcome. When they stop filling your cup, it's the same as Pastor Noel's indication, putting on his robe and start hoovering. You, you know, okay, honey, we got to go. They will continue to fill your cup in the Middle East as long as you are welcome. Sometimes late into the night, early into the next morning. But when it's time they stop filling your cup, that's a time for you to go. I want you to take that to heart this morning that God never, God never will stop filling your cup. God will never stop filling your cup. You are always welcome in His house. Always welcome. He has said, I'll prepare a table before, a table for you in the presence of your enemies. No matter what's going on around you, He will fill your cup. He says, I'll anoint your head with oil. That cup will be overflowing and overflowing. God has caused my cup to overflow with hope, love, and joy. I need to cling on to that even when I don't feel it. What does your cup overflow with? The reality is, is that if you're playing hurt, if you're doing life hurt, and you haven't seen to that hurt, your cup may be overflowing, but it not, may not be hope, love, and joy. It just may not be. You may have allowed your cup to be just full of pain, you may have been accustomed to it being full of unforgiveness and anger. Maybe you've just accepted that this is just who you are. This is the, how you're going to feel for the rest of your life. But wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. We serve a healing God. Don't ignore it. Don't run from it. Don't hide it. Don't give in to worry. And please don't allow bitterness to be your portion. Let God in. You know I'm teeing you up to something, right? You know I'm preparing for you for where we need to go next. You see, that's how church works, don't you know? That we get into the Word and it speaks to us about the theory and what we ought to do. And then we have a time of ministry and we decide to do business with God. And that's the practical. That's the practical. And I'm saying to you this morning, let God in. Let Him in. Let Him heal you. Let Him protect you. Let Him anoint you. Let Him fill your cup. Let Him in. Let Him deal with your heart and make it a soft heart. Pray a lament this morning. Recount your pain. Recall God's character and resolve to trust Him this morning. Can you stand in this place, please? If you're online, won't you prepare your heart just to receive from God this morning? Why don't you close your eyes just as you're standing here? We're gonna, we're gonna declare this altar open this morning. Because we're going to pause as we leaned into the presence of God in worship as we began this morning. We're not going to move 
on too quickly from there because God wants to heal you. He wants to fill your cup sufficiently. Maybe for some of you, He wants to remind you of who He is in your life. But I know for sure that He wants to deal with your pain. I will go back to that Psalm 13 that David read out during worship this morning. And that question of how long? You see, there's a how long that we need to ask ourselves. How long are you going to carry this in the same way that you've been carrying it? How long are you going to hold on to that bitterness? How long are you going to hold on to that unforgiveness? No, but I'm fine. I've forgiven them. I've moved on. It's okay. Nonsense. How long? How long are you going to decide to continue in the way that you're continuing, doing the same as you've always done and getting the same as what you've always gotten? How long? So I'm going to take a moment. The worship team's going to play. We're going to go into some worship right now. And I'm going to leave it to you to decide how long. Or if today is going to be a day when you put a period over that pain that you thought you'd been dealing with, but you really haven't. And then we're going to declare this place open, and it's open right now if you want to come forward. If you're ready to be prayed for, hands laid upon you. uh, Having the Holy Spirit in you for Him to deal with your pain. Let's worship in this place. And if that's you this morning, if you're going to make that decision this morning, come forward. Don't leave it for another Sunday. Don't ask that question, how long, even for one more day. Come on, let's worship in this place.
Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord. Lord, we just hand these things over to you, Father. We trust that Jesus wants to heal. And Lord, we just need to let him heal. So Lord, bless your people and anoint them, Father. Protect us, Lord God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Before we depart this morning, um, you know, I'm always tasked with doing the giving talk. And to be very transparent, the giving talk is very difficult sometimes, right? Because, you know, you're asking people to give to the church and... And I shared the business meeting last week how incredibly blessed and prosperous this church truly is. But one of the things that's always been on my heart is for more people to give, not because we feel guilty to give. There's a couple reasons to give. Number one is the Bible tells us to, and Jesus tells us to put him first and to put his kingdom first. But I think one of the most important reasons is just to love our neighbor. Right? Because when you give to the body of Christ, when you give to the church, the church is a mechanism for impacting our communities and for loving our neighbors. And, and, and Dennis, Pastor Dennis shared a really interesting milestone of statistics with us this week, which I thought was very powerful. One of my favorite ministries in this church is Care Portal. I, I think most people would agree that's a pretty incredible ministry. Wouldn't you agree? And for those who don't understand how Care Portal works, you know, social services goes and, and, and visits homes in the, in the city and the community, and they identify where there's significant needs for children. Right, whether it be beds or clothing or winter coats or whatever it is. And the churches, you know, subscribe to Care Portal and we meet those needs. The churches step up to meet those needs. So this week, one of the milestones that we reach as a church is we've served over a thousand children and had an impact of over three hundred thousand dollars in our community. That is one of the main reasons why this church exists is to bless our neighbor, to love our neighbor. And when you give when you sow into this ministry, when you sow into this body, you're not just sowing into this building, you're sowing into the salvation that goes out into our community through the service that we do and the inviting that we do. And that's a powerful testimony, if you ask me. Sometimes we, we, we invest our money and our time and our resources for a future return. And I love what Jesus says to the rich young ruler um, about you sell everything, all your possessions, and seek treasure in heaven. And there's no greater treasure in heaven than to see the, 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 the faces of those people in our community that may not have known Jesus, but because of an act of love, an act of obedience, they can see those things. So I want to encourage you to give. I want to encourage you, you can do it over the app. You can do it by giving an envelope and dropping it in the box by the front door. You can mail it. You can, Ven I don't know, you can't Venmo it, but you can do other ways to give. So I want to encourage you to give yeah, out of obedience, but also so we can love our neighbor, okay? I think it's important for all of us to do that. A couple of quick announcements. Uh, I always like to remind everyone we have prayer on Tuesdays at 5.30 here in the sanctuary. Uh, please, if you can come out, I know it's cold and it's dark at 5.30, but I assure you the presence of God is worth it. And we have a project, and if we want to put up the slide, we have a Love Lincoln project. So Lincoln Elementary School is a school not too far from here, and we have an opportunity between now and February 13th to bless those children with school supplies. They need school supplies. And I know this church always steps up when we have a requirement to do something like this. So Alyssa is going to be in the foyer after service. She has hearts with, uh, with listings of resources that these kids need. right? So if you want to pick up a heart from her, and you can go buy and acquire something and bring it back to church anytime between now and February 13th, 
that's going to be really important. So I want to encourage you. There's no reason why we should leave this morning without, with any hearts left in the foyer. There's no reason why we are so blessed and so grateful for everything we have. I want every heart to be gone this morning, and, and it would be an incredible uh, act of, 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 of obedience and love if we can buy school supplies for Love Lincoln for these children that go to school every day. So can we do that as a church body this morning? Can you guys go out and do that so we can serve our community? Okay, let's, let, oh, thank you. Wow, are you whistling at me or was, uh, was it the announcement? All right, let's stand so we can pray before we leave this morning. I'm going to pray my favorite church closing prayer. And now may this God, our God, the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant through brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ, to him be glory forever and ever, and may the grace of Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all today and every day this week and forevermore. In the name of Jesus Christ, and everyone said, amen.